Hello and welcome everyone to today's webinar where we will talk about best practices to help you establish a, establish a streamlined workflow and overcome some of the challenges you and your SOC are facing daily. Let me introduce myself real quick. My name is Julian Kraus. I'm a consulting analyst at Vectra AI. And me and my colleagues are responsible for delivering Vectra's MDR service. We have contact with a lot of different Vectra customers and help them get to the, get the most out of the platform. In that process, we naturally learn a lot about our customers and how they are using the platform and also where there oftentimes is potential for improvement. Some of that experience is what I want to share with you today. Before we start, I want to get a bit of housekeeping out of the way. You probably have noticed by now that the webinar platform you are looking at has a few extra widgets. The most important one, apart from the slides, is the Q&A box where you can send in your questions. We, have a look, we will have a look at the questions right at the end of the webinar. Other than that, please notice the resource list containing some helpful uh, and hopefully interesting links and also the survey section in the bottom of your screen. We would really appreciate if you took that survey before you leave today. With that being said, uh, let's begin. We will start today's webinar off by talking about what I have called the security dilemma. That will lead us to discussing the importance of prior prioritization. And after that, we will first focus on the assignment function, context and annotations all of which is available in Vectra out of the box. But we will also go beyond that with the SOAR integrations and the API that Vectra offers. To wrap things up, I will answer as many questions you have, uh, you have sent through the Q&A box we just looked at as possible. I'm sure uh, a lot of you who joined today know even better than I do how hard it is to adequately staff a SOC today and to stay on top of everything that's going on. That's why for a lot of uh, teams in our industry, the highest goal is to reduce the workload and to optimize visibility. Coverage is very important, but here I'm referring to a different aspect of visibility. Uh, look at the graphic on the left-hand side of the slide. How should anyone identify the one relevant alert that might be hiding in this mess? It's very much reality to lose visibility because you are basically seeing too much. Kind of like the saying, can't see the forest for the trees. To, to avoid this loss of visibility, we strive to minimize false positives uh, or the noise while obviously strictly avoiding to missing any of the true positives, which would equate to a false negative. Unfortunately, there's a strong inverse relationship between false positives and false negatives. Lowering one of them usually drives up the other. In other words, to not miss any of the relevant stuff, you simply must be overly cautious. Some may say a bit paranoid, and this inevitably leads to some number of false positives. This only gets amplified by administrative activity and attacker behavior being so hard to distinguish at times. Therefore, instead of only aiming to reduce the number of false positives, you need to minimize the attention and time you have to spend on them. Prioritization, automation, notification, and workflows are key for that. With any security tool, deriving maximum value from that tool depends on how it's being utilized and the level of integration within your greater security environment. 
for that, we will now talk uh, prioritization first and then focus on some of the best practices regarding automation, notification, and workflows. Prioritization is essential in guiding your attention and focusing on the most critical alerts. Arguably, the fidelity of priori prioritization is even more important than the alerts or the detections themselves. Accurate prioritization basically means that the right conclusions have to be drawn automatically, which makes it, which makes it a very hard problem to solve. Therefore, lots of research has gone and continues to go into the way uh, Vectra is prioritizing these events. In general, attackers need to carry out multiple steps we can detect to accomplish their ultimate goal. The detected behaviors are scored individually, but more importantly, correlated by host and account to provide prioritization of an entity's overall activity in relation to its movement along the attack lifecycle or the kill chain you are seeing in the bottom left. A combination of detections showing a progression through that attack lifecycle is essential to push a host into the high or the critical quadrant, which is essentially attributing it a high priority. With that groundwork out of the way, we will now get to the best practices you are here for. First, I'll talk about some features in the Vectra platform that I see not many customers taking full advantage of. One of them is uh, the assignments function. When an ex external ticket ticketing system is not utilized at your organization to track the review and investigation of hosts and detections, it's highly recommended to utilize the Vectra detect assignments feature which allows hosts and accounts to be assigned to any vector detect user. Let's first quickly go over the process of assigning an entity and resolving that assignment. After that, we'll dive into the workflow implications and what comes with, with this feature. We will walk through that on the example of a host but it's exactly the same for, for an account. Assignments can be done in two places. The first one being the host's overview we are currently look at, uh, we currently are looking at. Uh, let's zoom, zoom in on this table in the bottom to see that a bit better. Uh, for each host in this table, there's an icon for quickly assigning the host to a user of the platform. If you click on one of the icons, there will appear a drop down which will display all the users that you can assign the entity to. Once you select which user to assign the entity to, this, the blue check mark completes the assignment. The icon turning solid confirms that the assignment, the assignment is complete. Uh, assigning an entity works basically exactly the same from the assigned users box in the sidebar of the entity's individual page. In this case, we are seeing the host page of Conrad T480. Once you select which user to assign the entity to, the assignment box will change to show how uh, to show who has been assigned to the entity and also by whom and when. When an assignment has been created, all detections within that entity will also be assigned to the same user as can be seen on the right hand side with all the, the icons turning solid. Any new detections that come in while there's an active assignment will also be assigned to that user. Once a user has been assigned to an entity, they can then start or follow their normal workflow of investigations. You can also reassign an entity or delete an assignment with the pencil or the trash icon, a trash can icon in the assigned users box on the left hand side. Once the analyst is done with their investigations, they must close out their assignment by providing an outcome. 
To start the closing process, the user selects the check mark in the assignment box, which will open up a new modal. From here, the user can choose one of three outcomes to label this investigation and add some notes explaining his conclusions. After choosing the outcome, an option will appear to filter the active detections on the host if that's desired. Selecting the Resolve button will close out the assignment and store this outcome and the notes within Vectra to be used for reporting. The system will also record different aspects of the entity at that specific time, like detections, tags, etc., which will also be used for reporting. With this resolution, the host is now open to being reassigned if any new de detections come in or if there is another investigation necessary. Adopting this workflow basically gives you, on one hand, email alerts that are generated to notify the users about assignments, unassignments, and new detections on an assigned host. And then apart from that, you will be able to generate the operational metrics report. This can be done in the platform itself under reports and then operational metrics. This menu point will always be there, but if you generate such a report without utilizing the assignment features, it will be basically empty. This report helps organizations to understand how effective their teams are in investigating suspicious events in their network. There is a breakdown for different uh, metrics like the time to acknowledge or the time to respond, as well as you can see in the bottom, a distribution of outcomes, um, as well as the averages of other metrics um, based by outcome. On another page of this report, there will also be a list of impactful events, including the resolution notes that were uh, entered in the step we talked about prior, and also the important host and detection details that were uh, recorded during the resolution process. Another advantage of the assignment workflow in Vectra is that um, it does not require any additional tools or any setup work. So when you have Vectra set up and no other tool that is doing this for you, the, you can just yeah get started right, off, right away. There are, of course, also some limitations. The main one being that only people that have their own user account for the Vectra platform can be assigned to an entity. Members of your InfoSec team usually have an account, but other parties that are sometimes involved in investigation and remediation, like SysOps, for example, might not. Apart from that, this feature is definitely, definitely not as feature-rich or sophisticated as a full-blown ticketing system. <clears throat> but on the other hand, working with emails is easy and flexible and if desired, you could even kick off larger workflows through Power, Ad Power Automate, for example. The next topic I want to talk about is context and annotations. Pivoting back and forth between tools <clears throat> does take time and may break your focus. Sorry, I got to drink. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, that's what pivoting back and forth between tools uh, does take time and break your focus. That's exactly why uh, socks strive for a concept called a single pane of glass, which means uh, to have one tool or one user interface that consolidates all information available <clears throat> surrounding an alert. Vectra tries to come as close to that as possible with what is available to it. 
we derive contextual information from integrations with Active Directory, EDR, VMware, um, and all of the, the cloud providers. These contextual information <clears throat> allow us to, um, to highlight things like the host that's installed on uh, the, the operating system that's installed on a host, the Active Directory groups that a account is uh, a member of, uh, any SPNs that are registered for a host or, for example, the time of the last password update. These and many more are listed directly in the UI under the details tab for a host or an account. Apart from that, additional context can always be added manually by means of annotation. <clears throat> and there are many good reasons to do so. First of all, I guess probably all of you know the value of documentation, and that's not limited to software de development, but it's exactly the same for, for security. It's always good to write down some notes about um, your investigative steps and the conclusions you have drawn from that, because otherwise, in a lot of times, only a few days or a week later, you are wondering what uh, what actually uh, led you to this conclusion. And having these uh, documentations available right within Vectra <clears throat> enables some sort of knowledge transfer because not all analysts are the same and work the same. And it can be very, very uh, beneficial to, to look at some notes of an ana another analyst. And with that, you can see uh, these kind of annotations basically as an investment in the team's investigation time, where in on one hand, you are improving your, your analysts with this measure, but also if there's an incident that's similar to one that has, been, that has happened before, you can always look at the notes uh, for, for this prior incident and you know, maybe learn a few things for your current uh, your current incidents from that. Uh, there are mainly three ways of annotating entities in Vectra. The first being uh, the tags. Tags are short and sometimes temporary labels to put on a host or an account or an individual detection. It's quite important to agree on a specific structure for the tags for consistency and also ease of searching and reporting. Here we have an example where you could start off with a short acronym of the party that is placing the tag. If you're looking at the example in this uh, picture above, there's VSK, which stands for Vectra Sidekick, which is Vectra's MDR service. And then you could uh, place a keyword and, um, and some value uh, further specifying what, uh, what you want to say after that. Optionally, but sometimes also considered a best, best practice is to put the date uh, in the tag, the, ta the date of creation, because this is not easily um, viewable otherwise. So in some situations, you might want to see when a date was created, uh, a tag was created, and for that you would need to insert the date uh, right away in the, inside the tag. The biggest, or one of the biggest advantages of tags is that they are visible <clears throat> from outside of an entity's individual page, so you do not have to click inside and host and enter the, the host's detail page to see the text. You can always see it from, from this um, table overview we have seen before. And there will also be a, a screenshot in a minute where we can see that again. The second mean of annotation is notes. Uh, notes are meant for bigger pieces of context or, or text and contain detailed information about an entity or a case. This could be a protocol of steps and conclusions during an investigation, 
or also a link to a ticketing system, for example, where the progress is tracked and so on. One nice, nice thing about nodes is that they support markdown. So you can really uh, structure them nicely and even have some tables in there, for example. <clears throat> a third possibility for adding some context are the groups. And I personally think groups are very, very helpful in organizing your hosts by their role and potentially by the site or department they are located at. The grouping can be done in two ways, either based on IP addresses or by host names. And I would really recommend everyone to at least have a group containing all their clients and one with all their servers. But it makes a lot of sense to get more specific, for example, like servers that are allowed for external communication and ones that are not. Such groups are very handy when creating triage filter rules to limit the sources and the target conditions uh, specifically to the scope you, you want this filter rule to apply to. Groups a host is a member of are listed directly in the host's page, same as with the labels and the notes as can be seen in the screenshots. So we have the host groups and the tags and the notes. And the tags in the sidebar on the left-hand side are the tags that apply to this host. But you can also see in the detection overview for this host that each of the detections has a small uh, tag uh, icon for the tags. And if there would be a tag, this would be solid and you could click on it to yeah, quickly see the tags that are applied to this specific detection without having to open up the detection itself. This can save a fair amount of time. At some point along the journey, as your security posture develops and your team gets more mature, you might outgrow the solutions available directly within Vectra, and that's totally fine. Vectra does not aim at uh, replacing a full-blown security suite. Out of the box, Vectra has the essentials covered, I would say, but most importantly, it is able to grow with you. Store integration is one measure we take to make sure Vectra fits in your toolset wherever on the maturity curve you are. For that, we have ready-made integrations for the major, major source, namely IBM Curator, Splunk, or formerly Phantom, and also Palo Alto Cortex XOR. Through these integrations, a Vectra feeds changes of host and account scores, as well as information on triggered detections and other events to the SOAR. The SOAR can then create tickets or trigger whole playbooks and, and workflows based on the information in this feed. Additionally, the full host and de detection details are made available to be fetched on demand to augment any alerts and tickets. This brings your SOAR platform one step closer to being that single pane of glass we've talked about. Vectra does not insist on taking this position itself and is happy to provide all the info information that's available within the UI to augment other tools through this integration. Finally, Vectra accepts commands to triage detections based on the investigation's outcome directly from the SOAR either manually or as part of an automated workflow. Altogether, this enables you to implement powerful playbooks. I chose to highlight this uh, and some of the best practices on a real world example. This playbook is triggered whenever there's a new ransomware file activity detection in Vectra. It creates a Jira ticket, queries additional Vectra detections uh, and its details, and adds them to the ticket. It extracts any suspected C2 IP addresses, 
and automatically checks their reputation online and also adds this information to the ticket as well. After that, an analyst is prompted if based on the information that was automatically gathered so far, the host should be quarantined and the C2 IP is blocked at the firewall. If it's confirmed by an analyst, these actions are automatically carried out via the firewall or EDR integration for the SOAR. This highlights how a SOAR with the right integrations drastically reduces manual steps the analyst has to do and the need to pivot to other tools. The best practices I want to take, um, I want you to take away from this are, first of all, you have priori prioritization for all the reasons we talked about earlier and prioritization is great, but you will have some specific use cases that you want to know about regardless of if they are prioritized or not, or you want to potentially catch them early. So try to identify these specific use cases that are important to your organization and elevate alerts based on a detection type and um, at the detection type or sequence, or even some information that can be obtained directly from the detection details. Just a few examples on how this could look like. Maybe there is a detection saying that the RPC function DRS replica sync was called from a non-domain controller, and that's something you usually don't want to see. So you could have a workflow that is specifically looking for this detail and is bringing it to your attention, even though the detection itself might not be highly prioritized. This works also for spotting some uh, suspicious user agents or client tokens you want to uh, look for. A second best practice would be to automatically create tickets and enrich them with relevant information from Vectra, but could also be from logs or any other sources. And thirdly, you should really consider to predefine initial response actions, similar to the example above, where your SOAR um, would have a workflow or a playbook in place that can be triggered by an analyst if an investigation, um, uh, if during an investigation they come to the conclusion that some activity is actually malicious. What if Vectra does not have an integration ready for the SOAR you are using, or you are using your own custom tooling and want to integrate Vectra into that. That is where the API comes in. It essentially makes it possible to integrate Vectra into any workflow and toolset, further allowing Vectra to grow and mature with you through extensibility and customizability. Um, first of all, I want to give some general information about the API. It's a RESTful API to programmatically interact with Vectra via the standard HTTP methods. So the get, post, put, and delete you are all used to. And we are having all these endpoints available that you can see in the table on the right-hand side for different functionalities and parts of the UI. There's almost parity between the functionality that's available through the UI and the API. So there are only a few little things you can only do in the UI, but most of it is available to you also to yeah, trigger in scripts, for example. There's also a Python library for interaction with the Vector API that's publicly available on GitHub, together with some helpful scripts uh, to get you started. Capabilities that are available through the API include the following, but this is not a, a complete list. So there are more, um, there's more to it, but you can always fetch the full detailed information of any host account or detection. You can perform advanced searches 
for querying only specific hosts, accounts, or detections by some criteria you choose. You can always put additional context into Vectra by creating or updating tags and nodes. You can uh, triage individual detections through a single API call and also create and manage filter rules and groups, for example. The setup will typically look like pictured on the right hand side, where we have a Linux server running the script and acting as a middleman, talking to Vectra on one side and any third party tool that's offering an API as well on the other side. Some interesting use cases that can be um, can be obtained with the API are um, ticketing automation that is pretty much the same um, as with the SOAR integration we have discussed so far but you can integrate this with with an arbitrary arbitrary ticketing system as long as they offer an API there's some more advanced advanced things you can do of course in all the ticketing integration workflows it is considered best practice to have the script automatically put a tag on the host or the account and its, and its detections that is containing the ticket number after the ticket has been created in some use cases it may also be desir desirable to keep the nodes between vectra and the ticket in sync <laughs> and you can totally do that. In addition to automatically creating tickets, you could also initiate this process manually with an analyst tagging an entity in Vectra with a defined tag and the script polling for that tag via the API and then uh, triggering the ticket creation process for any entity that receives that tag. You could also put unique identifier of uh, a unique identifier of the owner of a machine or an analyst that is responsible for this machine on the host as a tag and use that to automatically assign the tickets to that specific person after they have been created. Apart from that, you can also do host or account isolation through the API either automatically by some custom criteria you define or manually initiated with the tag as we just discussed. But there does not always have to be a third party that's involved. The API can also be very useful to automate some tasks within Vectra. And this could be, for instance, ingesting some CSV file and creating a number of groups based on that that would otherwise take very long to create uh, manually. And of course, there are many other ways you can leverage the API, and we would love to hear about your best ideas. With that, we are at the end of the slides. I really hope you have learned a thing or two today and take some of these practices as an inspiration to enhance your own workflow. If you have any questions and have not already sent them through the Q&A box, please do so now. OK, we have already, have, uh, have already had some questions coming in. The first one being, this is the first time I'm hearing about the SOAR integrations. Where do I find them and how does the setup work? So we have integrations for the three SOARs I mentioned earlier and how the setup is working depends on which of the source you are using. So the process is a bit different depending on the SOAR. But uh, you can always head to support.vectra.ai and in the search box you find there, just enter the, the name of, your, of the SOAR you're using. And if we have an article covering setup and installation for, for this specific integration, you will find a knowledge base article there. Um, if you are using Palo Alto XOR, you're lucky because I've seen 
prior to this webinar that there was a video covering the setup um, published on, on our YouTube channel today. And yeah, if you run into any problems, always feel free to just log in on the on our support page and send a ticket towards our support team. They are always happy to help. Um, another question was if we support logpoint cm version 7 as a saw and yeah i unfortunately have to disappoint you there right now as far as i'm aware we only have the integration for the three source i i have mentioned in the slides and then one more question when resolving an assignment i have seen that there are three possible outcomes the benign true positive malicious true positive and false positive can you explain these what is a benign true positive supposed to be uh, okay so um i think a malicious true positive is pretty clear what this is about, but uh, the difference or what's, di what's di differentiating a benign true positive from a false positive, that can be a bit confusing. And yeah, sometimes it's also not necessary to differentiate here, but um, a benign true positive would be if you have a port scan, for example, a port scan detection. Um, this can always be either a detect, uh, an attacker doing this or it can be administrative behavior. So in Vectra, we are focusing on, on finding attacker behaviors. So not necessarily actually malicious uh, or actually the attackers, but yeah, I benign true positive would be an administrator that's that's performing a port scan. So we have um, detected this port scan correctly as what it is, but it's benign. And a false positive would be something that's totally wrong, where you are certain that something went wrong and we have attributed the, the, the wrong behavior to some network traffic or metadata. Yeah, I hope that makes it clear, but I think, think yeah, that's how you differentiate between the benign true positive and the false positive. Then there was a two other questions about how can we do integration with Outlook 365? and i'm not quite sure what's what's meant with that but we have detect for m365 so in detect for m365 we have a lot of detections that yeah uh, center around exchange um and and mailbox um mailbox takeovers for example so maybe that's what you are lo uh, looking for and then another one, do you support SOAR with Microsoft Sentinel? And yeah, I believe that this as well falls in the, into the category where we unfortunately have not a ready-made integration. So you would have to, have to um, rely on the API for that and um, yeah just try it out and with the same as with um with the ready-made integrations if you run into any problems with with the api you can always send a support request and someone will will come back to you okay i think that was all questions that have come in so far so uh, last call. If you have any questions, send them now. Otherwise, we will, yeah, be finished for today. And 
I I say thank you a lot for for your time and for coming. Uh, we appreciate so many people attending, and yeah, have a nice rest of your day. Bye.